The first part of Absalom and Achitophel by John Dryden. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Absalom and Achitophel, lines 1 to 490, by John Dryden. In pious times, ere priestcraft did begin, before polygamy was made a sin, when man on many multiplied his kind, ere one to one was cursedly confined, when nature prompted and no law denied promiscuous use of concubine and bride, then Israel's monarch after heaven's own heart his vigorous warmth did variously impart to wives and slaves, and wide as his command scattered his maker's image through the land. Michal of royal blood the crown did wear, a soil ungrateful to the tiller's care, not so the rest. For several mothers bore to God like David several sons before. But since like slaves his bed they did ascend, no true succession could their seed attend. Of all this numerous progeny was none so beautiful, so brave, as Absalom. Whether inspired by some diviner lust his father got him with a greater gust, or that his conscious destiny made way by manly beauty to imperial sway. Early in foreign fields he won renown, with kings and states allied to Israel's crown. In peace the thoughts of war he could remove, and seemed as he were only born for love. Whate'er he did was done with so much ease, in him alone twas natural to please. His motions all accompanied with grace, and paradise was opened in his face. With secret joy indulgent David viewed his youthful image in his son renewed. To all his wishes nothing he denied, and made the charming Annabel his bride. What faults he had, for who from faults is free, his father could not or he would not see. Some warm excesses which the law forbore were construed youth that purged by boiling ore and Amnon's murder by a specious name was called a just revenge for injured fame. Thus praised and loved, the noble youth remained, while David undisturbed in Sion reigned. But life can never be sincerely blessed. Heaven punishes the bad and proves the best. The Jews, a headstrong, moody, murmuring race, as ever tried the extent and stretch of grace, God's pampered people, whom debauched with ease no king could govern, nor no god could please, gods they had tried of every shape and size that godsmiths could produce or priests devise, these Adam wits, to fortunately free, began to dream they wanted liberty. And when no rule, no precedent was found of men by laws less circumscribed and bound, they led their wild desires to woods and caves, and thought that all but savages were slaves. They who, when Saul was dead, without a blow made foolish Ishbosheth the crown forego, who banished David, did from Hebron bring, and with a general shout proclaimed him king, those very Jews who, at their very best, their humor more than loyalty expressed, now wondered why so long they had obeyed an idle monarch which their hands had made, thought they might ruin him they could create, or melt him to that golden calf, a state. But these were random bolts. No form design nor interest made the factious crowd to join. The sober part of Israel, free from stain, well knew the value of a peaceful reign, and looking backward with a wise affright, saw seams of wounds dishonest to the sight, in contemplation of whose ugly scars they cursed the memory of civil wars. The moderate sort of men, thus qualified, inclined the balance to the better side, and David's mildness managed it so well, the bad found no occasion to rebel. But when to sin our biased nature leans, the careful devil is still at hand with means, and providently pimps for ill desires, the good old cause revived, a plot requires. Plots, true or false, are necessary things to raise up commonwealths and ruin kings. 
The inhabitants of old Jerusalem were Jebusites, the town so called from them, and there's the native right. But when the chosen people grew more strong, the rightful cause at length became the wrong, and every loss the men of Jebus bore, they still were thought God's enemies the more. Thus worn and weakened, well or ill-content, submit they must to David's government. Impoverished and deprived of all command, their taxes doubled as they lost their land, and, what is harder yet to flesh and blood, their gods disgraced and burnt like common wood. This set the heathen priesthood in a flame, for priests of all religions are the same, of whatsoe'er descent their godhead be, stock, stone, or other homely pedigree, in his defence his servants are as bold as if he had been born of beaten gold. The Jewish rabbins, though their enemies, in this conclude them honest men and wise, for twas their duty, all the learned think, to espouse his cause by whom they eat and drink. From hence began that plot, the nation's curse, bad in itself, but represented worse. Raised in extremes, and in extremes decried, with oaths affirmed, with dying vows denied. Not weighed or winnowed by the multitude, but swallowed in the mass, unchewed and crude. Some truth there was, but dashed and brewed with lies to please the fools and puzzle all the wise. Succeeding times did equal folly call believing nothing or believing all. The Egyptian rites the Jebusites embraced, where gods were recommended by their taste. Such savoury deities must needs be good as served at once for worship and for food. By force they could not introduce these gods, for ten to one in former days was odds. So fraud was used, the sacrificers' trade. Fools are more hard to conquer than persuade. Their busy teachers mingled with the Jews and raked for converts even the court and stews which Hebrew priests the more unkindly took, because the fleece accompanies the flock. Some thought they God's anointed meant to slay by guns invented since full many a day. Our author swears it not, but who can know how far the devil and Jebusites may go? This plot, which failed for want of common sense, had yet a deep and dangerous consequence. For, as when raging fevers boil the blood, the standing lake soon floats into a flood, and every hostile humour which before slept quiet in its channels bubbles all. So several factions from this first ferment work up to foam and threat the government. Some by their friends, more by themselves thought wise, opposed the power to which they could not rise. Some had in courts been great, and thrown from thence like fiends were hardened in impenitence. Some, by their monarch's fatal mercy, grown from pardoned rebels, kinsmen to the throne, were raised in power and public office high. Strong bands, if bands ungrateful men could tie. Of these the false Achitophel was first, a name to all succeeding ages cursed. For close designs and crooked counsels fit, Sagacious, bold, and turbulent of wit, Restless, unfixed in principles and place, In power unpleased, impatient of disgrace, A fiery soul which, working out its way, Fretted the pygmy body to decay, And o'er informed the tenement of clay. A daring pilot in extremity, Pleased with the danger when the waves went high, He sought the storms, but for a calm unfit would steer too nigh the sands to boast his wit. Great wits are sure to madness near allied, and thin partitions do their bounds divide. Else why should he, with wealth and honour blest, refuse his age the needful hours of rest, punish a body which he could not please, bankrupt of life, yet prodigal of ease, and all to leave what with his toil he won to that unfeathered two-legged thing a son, got while his soul did huddled notions try, and born a shapeless lump like anarchy. In friendship false, implacable in hate, resolved to ruin or to rule the state, to compass this the triple bond he broke, the pillars of the public safety shook, 
and fitted Israel for a foreign yoke. Then, seized with fear, yet still affecting fame, usurped a patriot's all-atoning name. So easy still it proves in factious times with public zeal to cancel private crimes. How safe is treason and how sacred ill where none can sin against the people's will, where crowds can wink and no offence be known, since in another's guilt they find their own. Yet fame deserved no enemy can grudge, the statesman we abhor, but praise the judge. In Israel's courts, ne'er sat an abethdin with more discerning eyes or hands more clean. Unbribed, unsought, the wretched to redress, swift of dispatch and easy of excess. Oh, had he been content to serve the crown with virtues only proper to the gown, or had the rankness of the soil been freed from cockle that oppressed the noble seed, David for him his tuneful harp had strung, and heaven had wanted one immortal song. But wild ambition loves to slide, not stand, and fortune's ice prefers to virtue's land. Achitophel, grown weary to possess a lawful fame and lazy happiness, disdained the golden fruit to gather free, and lent the crowd his arm to shake the tree. Now manifest of crimes contrived long since, he stood at bold defiance with his prince, held up the buckler of the people's cause against the crown, and skulked behind the laws. The wished occasion of the plot he takes, some circumstances finds, but more he makes. By buzzing emissaries fills the ears of listening crowds with jealousies and fears of arbitrary counsels brought to light, and proves the king himself a Jebusite. Weak arguments, which yet he knew full well were strong with people easy to rebel. For governed by the moon, the giddy Jews tread the same track when she the prime renews, and once in twenty years their scribes record by natural instinct. They change their lord. Achitophel still wants a chief, and none was found so fit as warlike Absalom. Not that he wished his greatness to create, for politicians neither love nor hate, but for he knew his title not allowed would keep him still depending on the crowd, that kingly power thus ebbing out might be drawn to the dregs of a democracy. Him he attempts with studied arts to please, and sheds his venom in such words as these. Auspicious prince, at whose nativity some royal planet ruled the southern sky, thy longing country's darling and desire, their cloudy pillar and their guardian fire, their second Moses, whose extended wand divides the seas and shows the promised land, whose dawning day in every distant age has exercised the sacred prophet's rage, the people's prayer, the glad diviner's theme, the young men's vision and the old men's dream. Thee, Saviour, thee the nation's vows confess, and never satisfied with seeing, bless. Swift, unbespoken pomps thy steps proclaim, and stammering babes are taught to lisp thy name. How long wilt thou the general joy detain, Starve and defraud the people of thy reign, Content ingloriously to pass thy days Like one of virtue's fools that feeds on praise? Till thy fresh glories, which now shine so bright, Grow stale and tarnish with our daily sight. Believe me, royal youth, thy fruit must be Or gathered ripe or rot upon the tree. Heaven has to all allotted soon or late some lucky revolution of their fate, whose motions, if we watch and guide with skill, for human good depends on human will, our fortune rolls as from a smooth descent, and from the first impression takes the bent. But if unseized, she glides away like wind, and leaves repenting folly far behind. Now... Now she meets you with a glorious prize and spreads her locks before her as she flies. Had thus old David, from whose loins you spring, not dared when fortune called him to be king, at Gath an exile he might still remain 
and heaven's anointing oil had been in vain. Let his successful youth your hopes engage. But shun the example of declining age. Behold him, setting in his western skies, the shadows lengthening as the vapours rise. He is not now as when on Jordan's sand the joyful people thronged to see him land, covering the beach and blackening all the strand. But like the prince of angels, from his height comes tumbling downward with diminished light. Betrayed by one poor plot to public scorn, our only blessing since his cursed return, those heaps of people which one sheaf did bind blown off and scattered by a puff of wind. What strength can he to your designs oppose, naked of friends and round beset with foes? If Pharaoh's doubtful succor he should use, a foreign aid would more incense the Jews. Proud Egypt would dissembled friendship bring, foment the war, but not support the king nor would the royal party e'er unite with Pharaoh's arms to assist the Jebusite, or if they should, their interest soon would break, and with such odious aid make David weak. All sorts of men, by my successful arts, abhorring kings, estrange their altered hearts from David's rule, and tis the general cry, religion, commonwealth, and liberty. If you... As champion of the public good, add to their arms a chief of royal blood. What may not Israel hope, and what applause might such a general gain by such a cause? Not barren praise alone, that gaudy flower fair only to the sight, but solid power. And nobler is a limited command given by the love of all your native land than a successive title long and dark drawn from the mouldy rolls of noah's ark what cannot praise effect in mighty minds when flattery soothes and when ambition blinds desire of power on earth the vicious weed yet sprung from high is of celestial seed in god tis glory and when men aspire tis but a spark too much of heavenly fire the ambitious youth, too covetous of fame, too full of angels' metal in his frame, unwarily was led from virtue's ways, made drunk with honour and debauched with praise. Half loath and half consenting to the ill, for loyal blood within him struggled still, he thus replied, And what pretense have I to take up arms for public liberty? My father governs with unquestioned right, the faith's defender and mankind's delight, good, gracious, just, observant of the laws, and heaven by wonders has espoused his cause. Whom has he wronged in all his peaceful reign? Who sues for justice to his throne in vain? What millions has he pardoned of his foes, whom just revenge did to his wrath expose? Mild, easy, humble, studious of our good, inclined to mercy and averse from blood. If mildness ill with stubborn Israel's suit, his crime is God's beloved attribute. What could he gain his people to betray, or change his right for arbitrary sway? Let haughty Pharaoh curse with such a reign his fruitful Nile, and yoke a servile train. If David's rule Jerusalem displease, the dog star heats their brains to this disease. Why then should I, encouraging the bad, turn rebel and run popularly mad? Were he a tyrant, who by lawless might oppressed the Jews and raised the Jebusite, well might I mourn. But nature's holy bands would curb my spirits and restrain my hands. The people might assert their liberty, but what was right in them were crime in me. His favor leaves me nothing to require, prevents my wishes and outruns desire. What more can I expect while David lives? All but his kingly diadem he gives, and that. But there he paused, then sighing said, Is justly destined for a worthier head. For when my father from his toil shall rest, And late augment the number of the blest, His lawful issue shall the throne ascend, Or the collateral line where that shall end. His brother, 
though oppressed with vulgar spite, yet dauntless and secure of native right, of every royal virtue stands possessed, still dear to all the bravest and the best. His courage foes, his friends, his truth proclaim, his loyalty the king, the world his fame, his mercy even the offending crowd will find, for sure he comes of a forgiving kind. Why should I then repine at heaven's decree, which gives me no pretense to royalty? Yet, oh, that fate propitiously inclined had raised my birth, or had debased my mind. To my large soul not all her treasure lent, and then betrayed it to a mean descent. I find, I find my mounting spirits bold, and David's part disclaims my mother's mould. Why am I scanted by a niggard birth? My soul disclaims the kindred of her earth, and made for empire whispers me within, desire of greatness is a godlike sin. Him staggering so when hell's dire agent found, while fainting virtue scarce maintained her ground, he pours fresh forces in, and thus replies, the eternal God, supremely good and wise, imparts not these prodigious gifts in vain. What wonders are reserved to bless your vein? Against your will your arguments have shown such virtues only given to guide a throne. Not that your father's mildness I contemn, but manly force becomes the diadem. Tis true he grants the people all they crave, and more perhaps than subjects ought to have. For lavish grant, suppose a monarch tame, And more his goodness than his wit proclaim. But when should people strive their bonds to break, If not when kings are negligent or weak? Let him give on till he can give no more, The thrifty Sanhedrin shall keep him poor, And every shekel which he can receive Shall cost a limb of his prerogative. To ply him with new plots shall be my care or plunge him deep in some expensive war, which when his treasure can no more supply, he must, with the remains of kingship, buy. His faithful friends, our jealousies and fears, call Jebusites and Pharaoh's pensioners, whom, when our fury from his aid has torn, he shall be naked left to public scorn. The next successor, whom I fear and hate, my arts have made obnoxious to the state, turned all his virtues to his overthrow, and gained our elders to pronounce a foe. His right, for sums of necessary gold, shall first be pawned and afterwards be sold. Till time shall ever wanting David draw to pass your doubtful title into law. If not, the people have a right supreme to make their kings, for kings are made for them. All empire is no more than power in trust, which, when resumed, can be no longer just. Succession, for the general good designed, in its own wrong a nation cannot bind. If altering that the people can relieve, better one suffer than a nation grieve. The Jews well know their power. Ere Saul they chose, God was their king, and God they durst depose. Urge now your piety, your filial name, a father's right and fear of future fame, the public good, that universal call to which even heaven submitted, answers all. Nor let his love enchant your generous mind, tis nature's trick to propagate her kind. Our fond begetters, who would never die, love but themselves and their posterity. Or let his kindness by the effects be tried, or let him lay his vain pretense aside, God said, he loved your father. Could he bring a better proof than to anoint him king? It surely showed he loved that shepherd well, who gave so fair a flock as Israel. Would David have you thought his darling son? What means he then to alienate the crown? The name of godly he may blush to bear, tis after God's own heart to cheat his heir. He to his brother gives supreme command, to you, a legacy of barren land. Perhaps the old harp on which he thrums his lays, or some dull Hebrew ballad in your praise. Then the next heir, a prince severe and wise, already looks on you with jealous eyes, 
sees through the thin disguises of your arts and marks your progress in the people's hearts though now his mighty soul its grief contains he meditates revenge who least complains and like a lion slumbering in the way or sleep dissembling while he waits his prey his fearless foes within his distance draws constrains his roaring and contracts his paws till at the last his time for fury found he shoots with sudden vengeance from the ground the prostrate vulgar passes o'er and spares but with a lordly rage his hunters tears in your case no tame expedience will afford resolve on death or conquest by the sword which for no less a stake than life you draw and self-defence is nature's eldest law leave the warm people no considering time for then rebellion may be thought a crime prevail yourself of what occasion gives and try your title while your father lives and that your arms may have a fair pretence proclaim you take them in the king's defence whose sacred life each minute would expose to plots from seeming friends and secret foes and who can sound the depth of david's soul perhaps his fear his kindness may control he fears his brother though he loves his son for plighted vows too late to be undone if so by force he wishes to be gained like women's lechery to seem constrained doubt not but when he most affects the frown commit a pleasing rape upon the crown secure his person to secure your cause they who possess the prince possess the laws he said and this advice above the rest with absalom's mild nature suited best unblamed of life ambition set aside not stained with cruelty nor puffed with pride how happy had he been if destiny had higher placed his birth or not so high his kingly virtues might have claimed a throne and blessed all other countries but his own but charming greatness since so few refuse tis juster to lament him than accuse strong were his hopes a rival to remove with blandishments to gain the public love to heed the faction while their zeal was hot and popularly prosecute the plot end of section one Lines 1 to 490. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The second part of Absalom and Achitophel by John Dryden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lines 491 to the end. To further this, Achitophel unites the malcontents of all the Israelites, whose differing parties he could wisely join for several ends to serve the same design. The best, and of the princes some were such, who thought the power of monarchy too much, mistaken men and patriots in their hearts, not wicked, but seduced by impious arts. By these the springs of property were bent and wound so high they cracked the government. The next, for interest, sought to embroil the state, to sell their duty at a dearer rate, and make their Jewish markets of the throne, pretending public good to serve their own. Others thought kings an useless heavy load, who cost too much and did too little good. These were for laying honest David by on principles of pure good husbandry. With them joined all the harangers of the throng that thought to get preferment by the tongue who follow next a double danger bring not only hating david but the king the solomian rout well versed of old in godly faction that in treason bold cowering and quaking at a conqueror's sword but lofty to a lawful prince restored saw with disdain an ethnic plot begun and scorned by jebusites to be undone hot levites headed these who pulled before from the ark which in the judges' days they bore, resumed their cant, and with a zealous cry pursued their old beloved theocracy. Where Sanhedrin and priest enslaved the nation, and justified their spoils by inspiration. For who so fit for reign as Aaron's race, if once dominion they could found in grace? These led the pack 
though not of surest scent, yet deepest mouthed against the government. A numerous host of dreaming saints succeed, of the true old enthusiastic breed. Against form and order they their power employ, nothing to build, and all things to destroy. But far more numerous was the herd of such who think too little and who talk too much. These, out of mere instinct, they know not why, adored their father's god and property, and by the same blind benefit of fate, the devil and the Jebusite did hate. Born to be saved, even in their own despite, because they could not help believing right. Such were the tools, but a whole hydra more remains of sprouting heads too long to score. Some of their chiefs were princes of the land. In the first rank of these did Zimri stand, a man so various that he seemed to be not one but all mankind's epitome. Stiff in opinions, always in the wrong, was everything by starts and nothing long. But in the course of one revolving moon was chemist, fiddler, statesman, and buffoon. Then all for women, painting, rhyming, drinking, besides ten thousand freaks that died in thinking, blessed madman, who could every hour employ with something new to wish or to enjoy. Railing and praising were his usual themes, and both, to show his judgment, in extremes. So over-violent or over-civil that every man with him was god or devil. In squandering wealth was his peculiar art. Nothing went unrewarded but desert. Beggared by fools, whom still he found too late, he had his jest, and they had his estate. He laughed himself from court, then sought relief by forming parties, but could ne'er be chief. For spite of them, the weight of business fell on Absalom, and wise Achitophel. Thus, wicked but in will of means bereft, he left not faction, but of that was left. Titles and names twere tedious to rehearse of lords below the dignity of verse. Wits, warriors, commonwealthsmen were the best, kind husbands and mere nobles all the rest. And therefore, in the name of dullness, be the well-hung Balaam and cold Caleb free, and canting Nadab let oblivion damn, who made new porridge for the paschal lamb. Let friendship's holy band some names assure, some their own worth, and some let scorn secure. Nor shall the rascal rabble here have place, whom kings no titles gave, and God no grace. Not bull-faced Jonas, who could statutes draw to mean rebellion and make treason law. But he, though bad, is followed by a worse, the wretch who heaven's anointed dared to curse, Shimei, whose youth did early promise bring of zeal to God and hatred to his king, did wisely from expensive sins refrain, and never broke the Sabbath but for gain. Nor ever was he known an oath to vent or curse unless against the government. Thus heaping wealth, by the most ready way among the Jews which was to cheat and pray, the city, to reward his pious hate against his master, chose him magistrate. His hand a vair of justice did uphold, his neck was loaded with a chain of gold. During his office treason was no crime, the sons of Belial had a glorious time, for Shimei, though not prodigal of pelf, yet loved his wicked neighbor as himself. When two or three were gathered to declaim against the monarch of Jerusalem, Shimei was always in the midst of them. And if they cursed the king when he was by, would rather curse than break good company. If any durst his factious friends accuse, he packed a jury of dissenting Jews, whose fellow feeling in the goodly cause would free the suffering saint from human laws. For laws are only made to punish those who serve the king, and to protect his foes. If any leisure time he had from power, because to sin to misemploy an hour, his business was, by writing, to persuade that kings were useless and a clog to trade, and that his noble style he might refine, no Rechabite more shunned the fumes of wine. Chaste were his cellars, and his shrivel board the grossness of a city feast abhorred. His cooks, with long disuse, their trade forgot. Cool was his kitchen, though his brains were hot. Such frugal virtue malice may accuse, 
but sure twas necessary to the Jews, for towns once burnt such magistrates require as dare not tempt God's providence by fire. With spiritual food he fed his servants well, but free from flesh that made the Jews rebel. And Moses' laws he held in more account for forty days of fasting in the mount. To speak the rest, who better are forgot, would tire a well-breathed witness of the plot. Yet, Korah, thou shalt from oblivion pass, Erect thyself, thou monumental brass. High is the serpent of thy metal made, While nations stand secure beneath thy shade. What though his birth were base, yet comets rise From earthly vapours, ere they shine in skies. Prodigious actions may as well be done By weavers' issue as by prince's son. This arch attester for the public good, By that one deed ennobles all his blood. Who ever asked the witnesses high race Whose oath with martyrdom did Stephen grace? Ours was a Levite, and as times went then His tribe were God Almighty's gentlemen. Sunk were his eyes, his voice was harsh and loud, Sure signs he neither choleric was nor proud. His long chin proved his wit, His saint-like grace, a church vermilion, And a Moses face. His memory, miraculously great, Could plots exceeding man's belief repeat, Which therefore cannot be accounted lies, For human wit could never such devise. Some future truths are mingled in his book, But where the witness failed, the prophet spoke. Some things like visionary flights appear, The spirit caught him up, the Lord knows where, And gave him his rabbinical degree Unknown to foreign university. His judgment, yet his memory did excel, Which pieced his wondrous evidence so well, And suited to the temper of the times, Then groaning under Jebusitic crimes. Let Israel's foes suspect his heavenly call, And rashly judge his writ apocryphal. Our laws, for such affronts, have forfeits made. He takes his life who takes away his trade. Were I myself in witness chorus placed, The wretch who did me such a dire disgrace Should wet my memory, though once forgot, to make him an appendix of my plot. His zeal to heaven made him his prince despise, and load his person with indignities. But zeal peculiar privilege affords indulging latitude to deeds and words, and Korah might for Agag's murder call in terms as coarse as Samuel used to Saul. What others in his evidence did join, the best that could be had for love or coin, in Korah's own predicament will fall, for witness is a common name to all. Surrounded thus with friends of every sort, deluded Absalom forsakes the court. Impatient of high hopes, urged with renown, and fired with near possession of a crown. The admiring crowd are dazzled with surprise, and on his goodly person feed their eyes. His joy concealed he sets himself to show, on each side bowing popularly low. His looks, his gestures, and his words he frames, and with familiar ease repeats their names. Thus formed by nature, furnished out with arts, he glides unfelt into their secret hearts. Then, with a kind compassionating look and sighs bespeaking pity ere he spoke, Few words he said, but easy those and fit, more slow than Hibla drops, and far more sweet. I mourn, my countrymen, your lost estate, though far unable to prevent your fate. Behold a banished man, for your dear cause exposed a prey to arbitrary laws. Yet, oh, that I alone could be undone, cut off from empire, and no more a son. Now all your liberties a spoil are made. Egypt and Tyrus intercept your trade, And Jebusites your sacred rights invade. My father, whom with reverence yet I name, Charmed into ease, is careless of his fame, And bribed with petty sums of foreign gold, Is grown in Bathsheba's embraces old, Exalts his enemies, his friends destroys, And all his power against himself employs. He gives... And let him give my right away, 
but why should he his own and yours betray? He only, he can make the nation bleed, and he alone from my revenge is freed. Take then my tears, with that he wiped his eyes, tis all the aid my present power supplies. No court informer can these arms accuse, these arms may sons against their fathers use, and tis my wish the next successor's reign may make no other Israelite complain. Youth, beauty, graceful action seldom fail, but common interest always will prevail, and pity never ceases to be shown to him who makes the people's wrongs his own. The crowd that still believes their kings oppress, with lifted hands their young Messiah bless, who now begins his progress to ordain with chariots, horsemen, and a numerous train. From east to west his glories he displays, and like the sun the promised land surveys. Fame runs before him as the morning star, and shouts of joy salute him from afar. Each house receives him as a guardian god, and consecrates the place of his abode. But hospitable treats did most commend wise Issachar, his wealthy western friend. This moving court that caught the people's eyes and seemed but pomp did other ends disguise. Kittifel had formed it with intent to sound the depths and fathom where it went, the people's hearts, distinguish friends from foes, and try their strength before they came to blows. Yet all was colored with a smooth pretense of specious love and duty to their prince. Religion and redress of grievances, two names that always cheat and always please, are often urged, and good King David's life endangered by a brother and a wife. Thus in a pageant show a plot is made, and peace itself is war in masquerade. O oh, foolish Israel, never warned by ill, still the same bait and circumvented still. Did ever men forsake their present ease in midst of health, imagine a disease, take pains, contingent mischiefs to foresee, make heirs for monarchs, and for God decree? What shall we think? Can people give away both for themselves and sons the native sway? Then they are left defenseless to the sword of each unbounded arbitrary lord, and laws are vain by which we write and joy. If kings unquestioned can those laws destroy? Yet, if the crowd can judge of fit and just, And kings are only officers in trust, Then this resuming covenant was declared when kings were made, Or is forever barred. If those who gave the scepter could not tie, By their own deed, their own posterity, How then could Adam bind his future race? How could his forfeit on mankind take place? Or how could heavenly justice damn us all Who ne'er consented to our father's fall? Then kings are slaves to those whom they command And tenants to their people's pleasure stand. Add that the power for property allowed Is mischievously seated in the crowd. For who can be secure of private right If sovereign sway may be dissolved by might? Nor is the people's judgment always true. The most may err as grossly as the few, and faultless kings run down by common cry for vice, oppression, and for tyranny. What standard is there in a fickle rout which, flowing to the mark, runs faster out? Nor only crowds, but sanadrins may be infected with this public lunacy, and share the madness of rebellious times to murder monarchs for imagined crimes. If they may give and take whene'er they please, Not kings alone, the Godhead's images, But government itself at length must fall To nature's state where all have right to all. Yet grant, our Lord the people, kings can make. What prudent man a settled throne would shake? For whatsoe'er their sufferings were before, That change they covet makes them suffer more. All other errors but disturb a state, but innovation is the blow of fate. If ancient fabrics nod and threat to fall, To patch the flaws and buttress up the wall, Thus fought his duty. But here fix the mark, for all beyond it Is to touch our ark. 
to change foundations, cast the frame anew, his work for rebels who base ends pursue. At once divine and human laws control, and men the parts by ruin of the whole. The tampering world is subject to this curse, to physic the disease into a worse. Now what relief can righteous David bring? How fatal tis to be too good a king! Friends, he has few so high the madness grows, who dare be such must be the people's foes. Yet some there were, even in the worst of days. Some let me name, and naming is to praise. In this short file Barzillai first appears, Barzillai crowned with honour and with years. Long since the rising rebels he withstood in regions waste beyond the Jordan's flood. Unfortunately brave to buoy the state, but sinking underneath his master's fate. In exile with his godlike prince he mourned, for him he suffered and with him returned. The court he practised, not the courtier's art. Large was his wealth, but larger was his heart, which well the noblest objects knew to choose, the fighting warrior and recording muse. His bed could once a fruitful issue boast, now more than half a father's name is lost. His eldest hope, with every grace adorned, by me, so heaven will have it, always mourned and always honoured, snatched in manhood's prime by an equal fate's and providence's crime. Yet not before the goal of honour won, all parts fulfilled of subject and of son. Swift was the race, but short the time to run. O oh, narrow circle, but of power divine, scanted in space, but perfect in thy line. By sea, by land, thy matchless worth was known, arms thy delight, and war was all thy own. Thy force infused, the fainting Tyrians propped, and haughty Pharaoh found his fortunes stopped. O oh, ancient honour, O oh, unconquered hand, whom foes unpunished never could withstand. But Israel was unworthy of thy name, short as the date of all immoderate fame. It looks as heaven our ruin had designed, and durst not trust thy fortune and thy mind. Now free from earth, thy disencumbered soul mounts up and leaves behind the clouds and starry pole. From thence thy kindred legions mayst thou bring to aid the guardian angel of thy king. Here stop, my muse. Here cease thy painful flight. No pinions can pursue immortal height. Tell good Barzillai thou canst sing no more, and tell thy soul she should have fled before. Or fled she with his life, and left this verse to hang on her departed patron's hearse. Now take thy steepy flight from heaven, and see if thou canst find on earth another he. Another he would be too hard to find. See then whom thou canst see not far behind. Zadok the priest, whom shunning power and place, his lowly mind advanced to David's grace. With him the Sagan of Jerusalem, of hospitable soul and noble stem. Him of the western dome, whose weighty sense flows in fit words and heavenly eloquence. The prophet's sons, by such example led, to learning and to loyalty were bred, for colleges on bounteous kinds depend and never rebel was to arts a friend. To these succeed the pillars of the laws, who best could plead and best can judge a cause. Next them a train of loyal peers ascend, sharp judging Adriel, the muse's friend, himself a muse in Sanhedrin's debate true to his prince, but not a slave of state, whom David's love with honours did adorn that from his disobedient son were torn. Jotham, of piercing wit and pregnant thought, imbued with nature, and by learning taught to move assemblies, who but only tried the worse a while, then chose the better side, nor chose alone, but turned the balance too, so much the weight of one brave man can do. Hushai, the friend of David in distress, in public storms of manly steadfastness, by foreign treaties he informed his youth, and joined experience to his native truth. His frugal care supplied the wanting throne, frugal for that, but bounteous of his own. 
Tis easy conduct when exchequers flow, but hard the task to manage well the low. For sovereign power is too depressed or high when kings are forced to sell or crowds to buy. Indulge one labour more, my weary muse, for Amiel. Who can Amiel's praise refuse? Of ancient race by birth, but nobler yet in his own worth, and without title great. The Sanhedrin long time as chief he ruled, their reason guided, and their passion cooled. So dexterous was he in the crown's defence, so formed to speak a loyal nation's sense that, as their band was Israel's tribes in small, so fit was he to represent them all. Now rasher charioteers the seat ascend, whose loose careers his steady skill commend. They, like the unequal ruler of the day, misguide the seasons and mistake the way, while he, withdrawn at their mad labor, smiles, and safe enjoys the Sabbath of his toils. These were the chief, a small but faithful band of worthies in the breach who dared to stand and tempt the united fury of the land. With grief they viewed such powerful engines bent to batter down the lawful government, a numerous faction with pretended frights in Sanhedrins to plume the regal rights. The true successor from the court removed the plot by hireling witnesses improved. These ills they saw, and as their duty bound, they showed the king the danger of the wound, that no concessions from the throne would please, but lenitives fomented the disease, that Absalom, ambitious of the crown, was made the lure to draw the people down, that false Achitophel's pernicious hate had turned the plot to ruin church and state, the council violent, the rabble worse, that Shimei taught Jerusalem to curse. With all these loads of injuries oppressed, and long revolving in his careful breast the event of things, at last his patience tired, thus from his royal throne, by heaven inspired, the godlike David spoke. With awful fear his train, their maker, in their master hear. Thus long have I by native mercy swayed, my wrongs dissembled, my revenge delayed. So willing to forgive the offending age, so much the father did the king assuage. But now so far my clemency they slight, the offenders question my forgiving right, that one was made for many they contend, but tis to rule, for that's a monarch's end. They call my tenderness of blood my fear, though manly tempers can the longest bear. Yet, since they will divert my native course, tis time to show I am not good by force. Those heaped affronts that haughty subjects bring are burdens for a camel, not a king. Kings are the public pillars of the state, born to sustain and prop the nation's weight. If my young Samson will pretend a call to shake the column, let him share the fall. But, oh, that yet he would repent and live. How easy tis for parents to forgive. With how few tears a pardon might be won from nature pleading for a darling son. Poor pitied youth, by my paternal care raised up to all the height his frame could bear. Had God ordained his fate for empire born, he would have given his soul another turn. Gulled with a patriot's name, whose modern sense is one that would by law supplant his prince. The people's brave, the politician's tool. Never was patriot yet but was a fool. Whence comes it that religion and the laws should more be Absalom's than David's cause? His old instructor, ere he lost his place, was never thought endued with so much grace. Good heavens, how faction can a patriot paint? My rebel ever proves my people's saint. Would they impose an heir upon the throne? Let Sanhedrins be taught to give their own. A king's at least a part of government, and mine as requisite as their consent. Without my leave, 
a future king to choose, infers a right the present to depose. True, they petition me to approve their choice, but Esau's hands suit ill with Jacob's voice. My pious subjects for my safety pray, which to secure they take my power away. From plots and treasons heaven preserve my years, but save me most from my petitioners. Unsatiate as the barren womb or grave, God cannot grant so much as they can crave. What then is left but with a jealous eye To guard the small remains of royalty? The law shall still direct my peaceful sway, And the same law teach rebels to obey. Votes shall no more established power control, Such votes as make a part exceed the whole. No groundless clamors shall my friends remove, Nor crowds have power to punish ere they prove. For gods and godlike kings, their care express still to defend their servants in distress. Oh, that my power to saving were confined! Why am I forced like heaven against my mind to make examples of another kind? Must I at length the sword of justice draw? O oh, cursed effects of necessary law! How ill my fear they by my mercy scan! Beware the fury of a patient man. Law they require. Let law then show her face. They could not be content to look on grace, her hinder parts, but with a daring eye to tempt the terror of her front and die. By their own arts, tis righteously decreed, those dire artificers of fraud shall bleed. Against themselves their witnesses will swear, Till viper-like their mother plot they tear, And suck for nutriment that bloody gore, Which was their principle of life before. Their belial with their bells above will fight. Thus on my foes my foes shall do me right, Nor doubt the event, For factious crowds engage in their first onset All their brutal rage. Then let them take an unresisted course, Retire and traverse and delude their force. But when they stand all breathless, Urge the fight and rise upon them with redoubled might. For lawful power is still superior found, When long driven back at length it stands the ground. He said. The Almighty nodding gave consent, And peals of thunder shook the firmament. Henceforth, a series of new time began. The mighty years in long procession ran. Once more the godlike David was restored, and willing nations knew their lawful Lord. End of Absalom and Achitophel by John Dryden. Recording by Thomas Copeland.